And good morning, church. Are you glad to be here? I'm certainly glad to be here, too. It's good to see everybody this morning. I know we've got a lot of uh, stomach virus going around and flu and whatnot, and I hate to hear that and see that, but uh, thankfully we are here, and I trust the Lord to keep us safe and sound in this building. Um, I had a, a person approach me last week and asked, uh, and they had good reasons for this, if I would read Scripture before I started preaching on it. And uh, I used to do that. I used to read Scripture, and then I'd go into the verse-by-verse -verse exposition of it. I don't know where I stopped doing that. I stopped doing it several years ago. And I told this person, I said, I'd be more than happy to read Scripture first and then go and comment on it. But the way I did it that years ago was we would stand up for the reading of God's Word. And if we're going to sing standing on the promises of God, I don't see any reason why we can't stand for the reading of God's Word. So if you will, stand with me as I read from Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. And you don't have to turn your Bible to it just yet. But I'll read it and we'll go to a prayer and then we'll have some commentary on it. Verse 19 of chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise, and let us consider one another to provoke him to love and to good works. And then in verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather in your house. Father, this missionary that has been going on for a very, very long time, and it's still going on, Father, because of your desire for it to go on. So, Father, help us to understand what our mission is in this 21st century. Help us to understand, Father, what uh, our marching orders are in this world that we live in. Help us to understand, Father, what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. And Father, as we're here this morning uh, on Sunday, help us to understand your word, what it means to us, how we can apply it, that all of these things may be put together nicely and neatly in a manner that we would be able to serve you to glorify your son, Jesus. But Father, we pray these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for that. I'm going to start this morning by asking this question. Who is God to most people? If we were to answer that question, who is God, most people would have one of these three answers. Number one, a lot of people would say that, well, God is somebody who might have created, but he's far off. He may or may not help us. It just depends on what kind of a mood he's in. It just depends on if we're in favor with him. Some people might answer the question, who is God, by saying he's someone to be feared. He watches over everything, he watches their every move, and he's a taskmaster. He's, uh, he's very firm. Some people might say that God is just a concept. He may or may not exist. He's no different than any of the other characters in a fairy tale. But I want us to understand this morning, I want people to realize this, that the God of the Bible is concerned with each and every single one of us. He hurts when we hurt. He rejoices when we rejoice. He understands our failings. He understands our issues, our problems. He cares about us. He cares for us in a way that no other entity can or would. The God of the Bible that we study should be revered and respected, but not feared in the sense of a mean and evil taskmaster, for he is not any of that. We should have great respect for him and great reverential awe for who he is and what he is and where he is and what he's doing. But his people should never be so afraid of him for being firm. We need a firm God. Amen? The God of the Bible contains an attitude for his people of a contractual covenant with each other. There's a lot of if-then statements in the Bible. Many of them are, are written that way. If we do this, then he'll do that. Or if I've done this, then you should, should do that. Some of them aren't written that way, but the idea is there. He is a covenant God. 
and he expects us to keep up our end of the deal. The God of the Bible is a balanced God. A balanced God. The world wants us to believe that the God of the Bible is just love. Now, he is love, right? God is love. But God is balanced in that love and that he is also wrathful. That doesn't mean that we're in trouble necessarily as long as we're in the blood of Jesus Christ. But because of his holiness, God can be perfect in his love and in his compassion and in his mercy and in his judgment and in his wrath and all the other things. Those things are perfectly balanced with God. And the fulcrum of that is Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? I hope you understand what I'm saying or what I'm saying. So I want you to have done already. I want you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to try to hopefully answer through Scripture some of the issues that are going on in our country with what's known as cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity is the early part of that, that God is just far off. You can't really know Him. He may or may not come. I don't have to do this. I can do that. God's okay with it. This is a very weak stance in Christianity, but it's a very popular one in our country because we have become more cultural than biblical. And I think that anybody that's in this room would amen that if you spend any time out in the culture with Christians. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's start at verse 19 and see what God's Word says about all of these things. Verse 19, Scripture records this. Having therefore, brethren, he's talking to saved people, he's talking to people under the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it this way, he's talking to Unity Baptist Church folks right now. God is talking to Unity Baptist folks, church right now. Having therefore, Unity Baptist Church, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. We were talking earlier in our Sunday school lesson with Bobby, who's doing a great job, that how is it that we always want more from God when God has given us the pinnacle, the epitome of everything that we truly need? What we need more than anything else is life. What we need more than anything else is life eternal. What we need more than anything, y'all, it's not another tractor, it's not another acre of land, it's not, what we need more than anything else is the ability to continue on our lives for all eternity. And God has provided that to us through Jesus Christ. So God has reached the pinnacle of Christian thought by the fact that we have this eternal life through Jesus Christ. There is nothing above that. There is no gold or silver or riches or land or people or relationships or, or money. There's nothing above it. That is the pinnacle of what we can be blessed with. And so as Bobby was telling us in Sunday school class, He's done enough. If God doesn't do anything else for any of us for the rest of our lives, He has done enough through the cross of Calvary and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. We okay with that? And if we read in verse 19, we're seeing where He says that we have therefore, because of Jesus Christ, we have this boldness, we have this confidence to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We have the ability to do something now that nobody else in history has had the ability to do, at least not the last, uh, the first 4,000 years of human history. We have the ability now to do something that nobody in the Old Testament could do. We have the ability now to do something that lost people can't do. And that is to approach God in His temple through prayer by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you think about it, think how, how rich we really are spiritually. Think how blessed we really are spiritually that because of Jesus and our faith in Him and what He has done for each and every one of us, we now can boldly, we can confidently go into the throne room of God, Almighty God, each and every one of us. Thank you. Look, in the Old Testament, the temple was built a lot more layers to it than this, but basically you had the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies, right? And the outer court is where certain people could go. They couldn't go in the inner court. You had to be Jew to be in the inner court. You'd go in the inner court. You couldn't go into the holy of holies. That was the high priest job. He went there once a year to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat of the ark for the atonement of people's sins, right? And temple history states that because this was such a serious business that they would tie a rope to the priest's ankle as he went in there because if he wasn't ceremonially ready to be in the presence of God, he would die and they'd have to pull him out. 
In the New Testament age, the church now represents the temple. We have the outer court, which is the parking lot. You have the inner court, which is the sanctuary. And you have the Holy of Holies, which is the pulpit area. Praise God that y'all don't have to put a rope on my, my ankle every time I go back there. Because I probably wouldn't make it because I'm not worthy. Praise God that God allows us to come into His house because we're not worthy to do that. We should, the doors of God's house should be shut on every one of us save for the blood of Jesus Christ. We have this opportunity now to come to God's throne through the church if you want to do that as a symbolic measure. Through the church. This is why we come at our invitation time. We come down to the Holy of Holies. We come right down here and we bow our knees and we say a prayer. Whatever it is that we're going to do business with God, we do it at the, at the, uh, the altar. You don't have to do it there. You can do it in your pew or in your car because of Jesus Christ. He's changed things. However, there's something really cool and special about coming to God's house in the inner sanctuary to the very steps of the Holy of Holies to do business with God. And we have that opportunity to do that. Every single one of us. Y'all don't need a priest. You don't need me to do it for you. You can do it for yourself. And by now, your heart ought to be leaping. Your heart ought to be going, Hallelujah! That we can do these things that God has made a way that I can do this myself. 19 again. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, confidence, assuredness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have this incredible opportunity, guys. Let me get to verse 20. By a new and living way. Something has changed in the New Testament from the Old Testament. There's a new living way. It's not the old death way where we have to make sacrifice. Something had to die in order that you and I might live. Something has died that was so incredibly powerful enough that it was a once for all thing. That's, of course, Jesus' death on the cross. By this new and living way, Jesus, which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. You guys remember the uh, latter part of the Gospels. The Bible records that when Jesus was crucified, the temple, yeah, David knows, the temple veil, which was about 30, maybe 40 feet high, real heavy, heavy, heavy material. And it was purple, as I recall. That has nothing to do with the LSU, y'all. Bad joke, okay. <laughs> it was purple. And when Jesus died, the Bible says that that curtain that separated the inner court from the Holy of Holies was rent from top to bottom, signifying that God is pleased now that there is no barrier to you anymore. There was a barrier at the time, but when Jesus died, that barrier was rent open from the heavens down to the earth, and now we have access to the Holy of Holies, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so he says in his word here, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. When Jesus' flesh was open, when he was finally at, at, at death on the cross, he has made a way for you and I to be in the presence of Almighty God. But cultural Christianity doesn't get too excited about that. We think in terms of, well, one day when I get to heaven. But guys, please understand, if you are under a relationship, a covenant with God the Father through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Heaven has come down now and resides in you. You are walking, talking slices of heaven. Well, Brother Bill, I don't walk and talk like that. Well, then what? You've heard me say this ad nauseum. When are we going to walk and talk this way? When are we going to start to understand I represent this incredible God that has done something phenomenal for me that I can be in His presence through prayer and through meditation that I can, I can be in His chambers that nobody else can do. And I'm going to tell people about this incredible God. I'm going to talk to people about this incredible God. He has made this new living way. There is no need for a sacrifice anymore. I have been under the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, His sacrifice. And that's all that it takes. And by that makes everything change. It makes all things change and new because of who Jesus Christ is and who He is in us. Verse 21. Oh, and having a high priest over the house of God. A high priest over the house of God. We understand that this is the house of God. Unity Baptist Church, we can call it the house of God because it is the house of God, right? Just like ABC Baptist or XYZ Baptist, whatever. Unity Baptist Church is the house of God. But more importantly, I think, is that if the Lord Christ lives in your heart, you are now the house of God. 
the residence of God, the house of God, is where God resides, right? If God resides in you and me, then we are now the temple of God. We are now the church of God. We are now the people that represents God, right? We are now the house of God. Luke, we are now, from God's perspective, the house of God. We have the outer sanctuary, we have the inner sanctuary, and we have the Holy of Holies. And God resides in the Holy of Holies. Man, I ought to have invitation right now. What an incredible God. Y'all listen. You know, uh, James Earl Jones, he's got that really deep voice. You know, I can't even do it. You know who I'm talking about? He did the voice of Darth Vader. I don't know. But I've got the voice of Barney Fife. <laughs> and when I get excited, he goes up and octave. I wish God would have given me this deep baritone. <laughs> what, what God has done for us. What God is doing. If God doesn't do anything else in our lives, He has done enough. Enough for us to serve Him. Enough for us to worship Him. Enough of us to be. Enough for us to care about what's going on in our lives and others' lives. Enough of us to uh, follow His Word and do what His Word tells us to do. Why do we struggle so much with this concept in America? He goes on in verse 22. It just gets better and better. Let us draw near. Because of all these things, let us draw near with a true heart. Let us draw near. Let us always draw near. Not just once a year like the high priest had to do. But let us draw near to him day after day after day. Always with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. There has been this incredible change with this person in verse 22. This may be a fictitious person, but I see me and you here. I hope you do too. That we have been sprinkled. Our hearts, our, the, the, the inner sanctuary, the holy of holies within us has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ from this evil conscience that we have had. And our bodies have been washed with the pure water of the word of God. Because of those things, let us draw near with a true heart. There is no reason why we would not draw near to God because we have been changed by God living in us. Tyson, there's no reason, no, there's no excuse whatsoever for us to be living mediocre lives. There's no excuse whatsoever for us to be leaving, leaving, uh, living complacent lives, apathetic lives spiritually. There's no reason whatsoever because we have been totally and remarkably changed by this incredible God named Jesus Christ. We should be the most spiritually prosperous people in the entire universe. But why are we struggling so much? Is it because we're letting our world seep into our hearts, into our churches, into the kingdom work that's around us? Is it because that we, we can't help it because we're living, and I get all that, but have we become more of the world than we have become of Jesus? Do we long for the things of the world? Are our desires for worldly things and one day when I get to heaven it'll be all better? Guys, we're missing, missing, missing the boat here. Verse 23. Not only are we to draw near to God, always. Scripture writes, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. I think of people that I know, y'all know, we all know, that had a movement, a spiritual movement perhaps, and came to the church and were baptized and we ain't seen them since. I know of people that have... Uh, I can't think of names off the top of my head, but band members, uh, current band music people that have had recording contracts and have top 40 hits on K-Love music and whatnot and renouncing their faith. Don't believe in that. Politicians are the same thing. And I'm thinking to myself, if the Lord Christ has really gotten a hold of you, how can you possibly renounce that? You can't. You can't do it. It cannot be done. It's impossible. If Jesus Christ is real and He's real in you, it is impossible. So I would tell these people, your conversion experience didn't take. 
Perhaps it wasn't an emotional response to something. Perhaps everybody was doing it. It was peer pressure. But if the Lord Christ really got a hold of you like he got a hold of Paul and Peter and Andrew and Stephen and Mark and Matthew, if he really got a hold of us, we wouldn't be renouncing our faith. And this is what the Bible is telling us. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promised. He, is, he will do what he says he will do. And the great thing about Jesus Christ is this. One of these days, we're going to make the transition from this inner sanctuary to the Holy of Holies in heaven. And God's going to get us there because He's not going to take us 80% of the way, or 85% of the way, or 90% of the way, or 95% of the way. He's going to take us all of the way from the promise of, I will get you out of the muck and the mire that you're in, and I will deliver you to the presence of my Father in heaven. I will get you there. And while we're on that journey, serve me, love me. Tell people about me. I'm going to get you through point A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, till I get you where your point around is, and that's before God in heaven. What an incredible God that we had that we serve. Verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. Guys, one of the things that I've noticed in church work is there's none of this provocation of, of love and good works. There's this provocation of let's be lazy and take shots at one another. Or is it just me? Have y'all noticed that about church work? We have a tendency to, I want it my way because I'm living in the world. And if you don't line up with my way, then you're not in my world. And we're going to have problems. We're going to have those McCoys. We're going to fight like they ain't never fought before. And I'm going to character assassinate you. I'm going to rumor about you. I'm going to go to the, the, the county seat and tell everybody all the lies about you. And I don't care. That's what I see. I see the provocation of meanness and anger. Not in everybody, but in a lot of people that claim to be under the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you this question. How is it possible when God says don't do that, and we do it, how is it possible that God's leading us in our inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies? How is that possible? It is impossible. God will never take you somewhere where he, His Word clearly says He ain't going. And I'm guilty too. I don't know about y'all. I don't know y'all well enough. I know me. I wish I didn't know me. I'm just as guilty as sin doing these things. Are y'all? I just stood up before all y'all and said the truth. Are y'all? Are we guilty of this? Jesus in verse 24 says, let us consider, I, I consider Jesus writing the Bible. So when I say Paul wrote this in my opinion, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but I, I, I see it as Pauline, or written by Paul. Verse 24, and let us consider, written by God's Holy Spirit through Paul, and let us consider one another to provoke into love and to good works. Let us stir up one another love and good works. Bobby, love, the love like Christ loved us, and kingdom work. There are no good works other than kingdom work. Look, Unity Baptist Church has no good works. ABC Baptist Church has no good works. Main Street Baptist Church has the first Baptist that none of them have. The only good works that we have are kingdom works. And we're to stir ourselves up to love and kingdom work. To love and kingdom work. Until we finally love to do kingdom work. That's what God's word is trying to convince us to do. Then he gives in verse 25 a very well known verse. He says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Verse 25 is a very powerful verse, and in the original language, it is a command. This is a command from God. We read it as, a, well, we're not supposed to do this, all right, what, what's the big deal? In the original language, the sentence structure is in the form of a command. God is commanding us in verse 25, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. See, the cultural Christian will say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And you're right. You don't need to go to church to be a Christian, but you're not going to be a very good one. I don't need to be a, a fly an airplane to be a pilot. You're absolutely right. You don't. You can be a pilot and not fly an airplane, but what good are you? I don't have to be in the class to be a teacher. You're absolutely right. You can be a teacher, but what good are you? I can be the President of the United States, but I never go to the White House. I never go to Congress. Well, what good are you? We can say that 
we're Christians that never go to church, but honestly, what good are we? Because we are to love kingdom work. And this is the missionary outpost to do kingdom work in this area, five mile radius from this church. So we are not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. And I don't know what y'all are thinking. I'm here. They're not. You need to preach this to those who aren't here. I get that. Tell them I said that, okay? Tell them I'm preaching this. Don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together. As the manner of some is. Jesus understood. God understood. People would get that way because we're going to get more cultural than we will biblical. But he says don't do that. But we are to exhort one another. We might to forsake worship. We are to exhort one another. As so much the more as you see the day approaching. And what day is that? That's the day of the Lord. That's the day of the Lord's return. And guys, listen to me. Listen to my heart. The return of Jesus Christ is imminent. More so now than 50 years ago by far. More so now than 10 years ago by, by far. More so now than 5 years ago by far. The Lord's return is imminent. We may not get out of this building before He, he calls His church home. That's how close it is. Every prophetic time or thing on the timeline that talks about the return of Jesus Christ has come to pass except one thing, and that is the rapture of the church. We are on the prophetic timeline. We are waiting on the rapture of the church. And it's very, very close, I think. The Tyson's so close, I used to say it's going to happen in my children's lifetime. I think now it's going to happen in my lifetime. That's how close we are. And I think God needs to see us not provoking one another to anger and wrath, but provoking one another to love, love of kingdom work, love of God's church, love of God's people to the point where we are on fire, we are zealots for doing the things that God's called us to do. Can you imagine Jesus coming by me and he sees his church? We might even miss it. Like, hang on, hang on, I've got to do this kingdom work. That would be so cool rather than we're just sitting around kind of waiting for things to happen. Right? Here's a clue to church work. It's not what you get. It's what you give. Cultural Christians come to church because of what they can get out of it. Biblical Christians come to the church for what they can give to it. And we give love and kingdom work through the church and for the church because of the church. And we might say at this point, so what, preacher? I'm thinking of that fried chicken. Our mama's got the meatloaf going, and it's getting by the time I missed out on breakfast. What's the big deal? Let me finish the big deal with y'all. In the next verse. Verse 26. This is a warning. For if we sin willfully... After that which we have received the knowledge of the truth, <clears throat> there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Wow. Do you know what the Bible just said? It doesn't matter what a person professes. If a person chooses to live in sin, there's no sacrifice for them. Cultural Christianity will say, I can do whatever I want to do, and because God loves me, it's going to be okay. I'm, I'm a child of God. I can, he understands I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I think God's going to come back and He's going to bust those fallacies wide open. It's not what we profess, church. It's what we do. Let me read this. The death and sacrifice of Jesus has no effect upon a person who continues to sin habitually. And not being engaged with our Lord and our gifts at the local church is sinful. Provoking others to wrath and mean and just, I don't know, stirring the pot all the time is sinful. Not doing the love and the kingdom work and loving the kingdom is sinful. Making excuses after excuses, as the world does, is sinful. Jesus, as a covenant God, says this, if you're going to come to me in my sacrifice, and I'm going to prove to you that sacrifice was pleasing to the Father by the fact that I've been resurrected from the grave, if you're going to take that as your get out of hell free card, I'm going to expect you to do some things for me while I leave you here. I'm going to require you to be biblical and not cultural. 
And as verse 26 says, if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for any one of us. Jesus, the word of God, has said this. If we trample the blood of Jesus Christ under our feet, you have no sacrifice. If we are not a lot about our walk with God, if we are carefree about our spiritual well-being, if we are um, laissez-faire about godly things and biblical things, God says there is no sacrifice for you because you are making a mockery out of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. You are making a mockery out of what the Word of God says to you. And all the cultural Christianity in the world ain't going to cut the pie when it comes to being in front of a holy God at Judgment Day. So the question now is this. Where are we really at? With God. More importantly, where is God really at with us? Now listen to me. Some of us work as police officers or nurses or uh, we are providentially hindered being in church all the time. I get that. I don't have a problem. But if you're a born-again Christian and you have Sundays free to yourself, out of 52 Sundays, we have to log at least 40, 45 Sundays in God's house. Do you think? Wouldn't that be like a minimum? Yeah, I think that's the time. Our boss wouldn't appreciate us missing all that time, would he? When we get here, if we've got these attitudes that's wrong, it's mean. You know, guys, listen. Is Jesus Christ happy with where we are right now? Is he happy? Is he satisfied with the lives that we're living? Have we gotten our Christianity out of the culture or out of the Bible? What would Jesus say? You're more cultural than you are biblical. I don't know. I know one thing. If we're more cultural than we are biblical, we are in a world of hurt. And we need to snap out of it and get ourselves back biblical by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God and by the written Word of God. That we may be pleasing to God. Amen? Amen. So the invitation simply says, where would Jesus say we are at? And if we would say, I don't know if Jesus is happy, but I would be down here this Holy of Holies just as soon as I started to say the word Amen and get right with Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, last point. He's closer today in returning than he was yesterday. He's on his way. And it's imminent. And you don't want to miss the call. Father, I thank you for this. I, I, I thank you, Father, for the fact that you love us. You care about us. You're not somewhere out in space just hoping we get it on our own. Father, you wrote us a love letter. You give us a Holy Spirit. You show us who you are through the form of your Son, Jesus Christ. You tell us what needs to be done and what we need to stop doing. And Father, I pray that as, as the culture has influenced Christianity more so maybe than the Bible has in the last 200 years, Father, we would snap out of that and come back to biblical Christianity, Father, which means we're going to have to live the way your Bible tells us that we have to live and not the way we want to. For that makes us God and you subservient. And so, Father, this invitation, I pray, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that's the first thing they've got to deal with. If they do, Father, but they, they just haven't really been performing um, or surrendered, I should say, to you well enough where you can work through it, Father, I, I pray that's the next thing to do. If there's someone here, Father, that uh, is looking for a missionary outpost where they can come in and, and start being missionaries in this area and doing kingdom work, Father, I pray, Father, you put it on their heart. If this is the place you'd have them to be, that they'd make that transition. I pray, Father, as I'm just a talking donkey, that people have not heard me, but they've heard you in the words that came out of my mouth today. For these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 488. Please stand with me. 488.
Amen.